this week. And those are some of the headlines. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. And I'm Juan Gonzalez. Welcome to all of our listeners and viewers around the country and around the world. Afghan President uh, Hamid Karzai is set to meet today with the families of 16 civilians killed in a massacre allegedly committed by a single U.S. soldier. Yesterday, Karzai called on U.S. troops to withdraw from Afghan villages. Meanwhile, the Taliban has announced they're suspending peace talks, even as U.S. officials say they hope to stick around to, to a 2014 withdrawal schedule for troops in Afghanistan. After meeting with Karzai, U.S. Defense Secretary Leon Panetti, Panetta again promised the unnamed suspect in the shooting rampage that killed mostly women and children would be brought to justice. I assured him that uh First and foremost, uh, that uh, I shared uh, his regrets about what took place, uh, that we extended uh, our deepest condolences to the, to the families, to the villages, and to the Afghan people uh, over what uh, occurred. And uh, I again pledge to him that uh, uh, we, are, we are proceeding with a full investigation here and that we will bring uh, the individual involved to justice. And uh, he, uh, he accepted that. That was Defense Secretary Panetta. Many Afghans have raised questions about the U.S. military's statements on the massacre. On Thursday, the Pajwark Afghan News Agency reported an Afghan parliamentary probe determined up to 20 U.S. troops were involved in the massacre. The Afghan lawmaker Hamizai Lali told the agency, quote, we are convinced that one soldier cannot kill so many people in two villages within one hour at the same time, and the 16 civilians, most of them uh, children and women, have been killed by the two groups. The U.S. soldier accused in the massacre has been flown out of Afghanistan to a detention center in Kuwait, despite several Afghan lawmakers and residents saying he should have been tried in Afghanistan. A senior U.S. commander defended the move, saying it was made to help ensure a proper investigation and trial. The suspected killer's name has not been released, but he's been identified as a 38-year-old staff sergeant who served three tours of duty in Iraq, where he suffered a head injury. This was his fourth tour of duty in Afghanistan. Yesterday, prominent Seattle defense attorney John Henry Brown announced he'll represent the soldier. Brown's past clients include serial burglar Colton Harris-Moore and serial killer Ted Bundy. At a news conference in Seattle, Brown said the soldier's family was shocked at what happened. He was told that he was not going to be redeployed. Uh, and what, were, what the family was counting on him not being redeployed. Uh, and so he, he and the family were told that his tours uh, in the Middle East were over, and then literally overnight that changed. So I, I think that it would be fair to say that he and the family were not happy that he was going back. Oh, they were totally shocked. Um, he's never said anything. Um, uh, antagonistic about Muslims. He's never said anything antagonistic about uh, Middle Eastern individuals. Uh, he's, in general, been very mild-mannered, so they were very shocked by this. We're joined now by journalist Neil Shea. He's joining us from Raleigh, North Carolina, has reported in Afghanistan for many years for the Stars and Stripes, the military newspaper, and the Christian Science Monitor, among others. His latest article in The American Scholar is called Afghanistan, a Gathering Menace. Traveling with U.S. troops gives insights into the recent massacre. We welcome you, Neil, to Democracy Now! Yours is an extremely disturbing article. Tell us what you have found. Just walk us through the descriptions you share in your piece. Well, good morning, Amy and Juan. Um, I found that during one of my last trips to Afghanistan, I met up with a group of soldiers who were the first I'd ever come across who made me feel pretty nervous about what I was going to see while I was with them. Um, and I spent a few days with them and came to just really understand that they had gotten to the edge of, of violence, as we understand it, in Afghanistan, and they seemed ready and capable of doing some pretty bad things. I didn't actually witness them do um, anything too terrible, but the way that they talked and the way that they acted toward Afghan civilians and uh, animals and property in the country was, was sort of stunning to me. And that's what I describe in the article. It's talking about these this group of soldiers and sort of their mental state during a multi-day 
mission in a central part of Afghanistan that was supposed to be a Taliban stronghold. Many of these guys seemed like they had reached the end of their rope in terms of uh, stability uh, in, in controlling their aggression. Well, Neil, what I found amazing about your story is, as you say, you focused not on uh, any high-profile event that might be considered uh, something illegal done by the troops or a, a war crime, but on the everyday occurrences uh, that created greater and greater distance between this particular group of U.S. soldiers and the civilian population. At one point, you write, Evil or atrocity often explodes from a furnace built by the steady accretion of small, unchallenged wrongs. Some men in this in destroyer platoon had been drifting that way for a long time. Can you talk about some of those incidents that you witnessed that, uh, that were part of this buildup of the psychological uh, perspective, viewpoint of, of these men? Sure, Juan. The, um in some ways, this article was a culmination of things that I've seen uh, since 2006, when I first started covering uh, the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. And um, during those years, I've seen soldiers and Marines sort of build up through these cycles of aggression um, to the point where they start doing—they begin with small things. They'll insult Iraqis or Afghans behind their backs, and that's sort of the very mild beginning of it. And then they sort of move up the chain, if we can call it that, into more serious acts of aggression, where they'll kill animals or they'll beat somebody or, or treat them roughly, and, and sort of builds up from there. Um, what I saw with these guys in Afghanistan when I was with them was that several of them had already been through multiple tours in Iraq and Afghanistan, and they had reached a point where they hated Afghans, they hated the country, um, and they were really not interested in doing any of the hearts and minds stuff anymore that's a crucial part of the mission. So by the time I reached these guys, they had already been sort of they had been building up anger and, and aggression in strange ways for a number of years. And when I saw them, they had just shot a dog that had been a pet in an Afghan home that they had confiscated uh, during the mission. And they treated uh, Afghan civilians fairly roughly, and they took a few prisoners and treated them very roughly as well. Nothing that would rise to necessarily the uh, sort of a crime at that time, but uh, the way that they talked about things and the way that they sort of handled themselves. Uh, was really aggressive, and it was it was only it seemed to me only to be barely kept in check. Uh, so it's just this small when we cycle our soldiers and marines through these wars that don't really have a clear purpose over years and years. I write in the article that we begin we expect light switch control over their aggression. We expect to be able to turn them into killers and then turn them back into. Uh, winners of hearts and minds. And when you do that to a, a man or a woman over many years, that light switch control begins to fray. And that's what I believe I was seeing with these guys in Afghanistan. You also mentioned uh, something that I don't think uh, many Americans here realize, that when these, uh, uh, these uh, platoons go out, on, especially on uh, multi-day patrols, that they often just take over the homes of uh, Afghans, evict them and give them a few dollars, and basically to order them out of their homes and take them over for their own, uh, uh, for their own refuge. And this creates—you uh, quote one soldier saying, well, we helped create more Taliban today. Uh, because of the, the soldiers themselves recognizing that their um, their actions were creating enormous hostility in the population. Right. This is a, this was a fairly standard practice in Afghanistan and even in Iraq when platoons were moving out through uh, really rural areas or even some urban areas. They needed a place to bed down for the night. They'd try to find either an abandoned house or if they couldn't find an abandoned one they would move into a place that was relatively secure, and they'd sort of kick the family out and try to pay them for their, for their uh, trouble. In this particular case, I was told that the Afghans didn't take the money from the American troops because they didn't want anyone in the region to think that they were siding with the Americans. They were afraid that by taking the money, they'd be seen as American uh, sort of collaborators and perhaps killed later. But the point I was trying to make when I talked about 
when I quoted that soldier as saying that they were on a Taliban recruiting drive, um, he was actually talking about the fact that they had, they had treated the Afghans so badly during the mission that the Afghans were going to obviously choose the side of the Taliban because now they hated the Afghan army and they hated the Americans. So the, the, the brutal treatment that the Americans had sort of pushed upon them drove these civilians into the arms of the Taliban. And that's what uh, that particular soldier was talking about. And American soldiers all across Afghanistan run into that problem, um, just as they did in Iraq, where they have a job to do, but sometimes they have to do it so roughly that the civilian population actually turns against them. And uh, so that's what that was about. Neil Shea, you quote uh, an American Army sergeant who said to you, this is where I come to do effed up things. And I wanted to ask you about this report um, uh, we, we can't confirm um, that says up to 20 U.S. troops executed Panjwai massacre pr uh, pro by Bashir Ahmad Nadiman. Um, and it's from Kandahar City, Pan. It says a parliamentary probe team on Thursday said up to 20 American troops were involved in Sunday's killing of 16 civilians in southern Kandahar province. Now, all the information that we are getting about what took place um, is from the military. You know, who this man is, the number of uh, tours of duty he had, three in Iraq, one in Afghanistan, that he had a TBI, a traumatic brain injury, and a rollover in Iraq, and now he's been taken out, so we don't have any access to him. So that's that's what the U.S. is saying. Uh, and uh, The New York Times spoke to family members uh, of some of the uh, people who were killed, so we know what happened to some of the people killed. But what about this kind of story that is going around in Afghanistan? Do you find it credible, the idea that it was more than uh, one person who did the killing? At this point, I don't really think that it's credible. Um, while, it, while it still is possible that it was more than just this one soldier who were involved in it, I think that the idea that it was 20 soldiers from one particular unit going into a village to just sort of slaughter people, that, that actually sounds very far off base to me. Um, and I do know that in Afghan culture, at least from my observations, Rumors travel very quickly, and they take on their uh, sort of they they gather facts as they go, and and sort of uh, like a game of telephone. So I wouldn't be surprised if this story was sort of exaggerated and uh, built up by this point. It would it would really shock me if it was an organized effort by a group of 20 U.S. soldiers, because um, well, for the simple reasons that it would be very difficult for to keep an a, a, a heinous crime like that so quiet, even though the, the U.S. military is sometimes good at keeping things quiet, that would be almost too big for them to uh, squash. And, and, Neil, I'd like to ask you, uh, you've been reporting, as you say, from I Iraq and Afghanistan now for several years. The length of this war in Afghanistan, more than 10 years now, what it's done uh, to the American uh, military? Well, I was asking, when I was there last time, I was actually asking um, specific soldiers about this, what they thought the, uh, the military, what damage had been done to the military during the war. And many of them felt that the military had actually been broken by this continued cycle of war. Um, these were usually staff sergeants, command sergeants, mid-level sergeants, who are sort of the backbone, as they call them, of the Army. And they really felt that the a lot of things had deteriorated and eroded during the last 10 years. And uh, soldiers and Marines, even airmen in, in the other branches, told me this. So I think that there's been a great degree of strain uh, on the American military, particularly in Afghanistan. And that's partly because, since the beginning of the war, the, the goal has changed and the mission has changed. So every few years, uh, the military is having to adapt to something new, and there doesn't really seem to be a clear exit strategy. And uh, so just sort of constantly refitting itself to adapt to a changing set of demands has created incredible strain. And finally, uh, the 
you know, how we know what we know right now about what's happened. Of course, there was the story of Pat Tillman, uh, the belief originally the U.S. military put out that he was killed by enemy fire, and ultimately, of course, it was, if you call it friendly fire, it was fellow soldiers, um, and then taking that to this story. So I guess you're asking about uh, whether or not it could be uh, sort of a cover-up or, or, or the right. nature of information? Not trying to figure out how we know what we know, as the, as the people in the United States and Afghanistan deal with what took place. Um, we have to right. be very aware of what our source of information is, that we don't have independent confirmation. Yeah, indeed. I think that uh, it's entirely possible that right now we're just sort of being led along with the thinnest of facts. So I'm reluctant to talk about this too much, but, you know, the U.S. military does have a history of trying to keep things under wraps, and, and uh, particularly something like this. I know the temptation is very strong for them to sort of try to control the story and the message very tightly. So it will be very difficult for journalists to get into this story and sort of crack it open, but absolutely necessary for us to understand not only what happened in Kandahar, but what's happening to the men and women that we asked to go fight this war. Neil, we want to thank you very much for being with us. Neil Shea has reported in Afghanistan for many years for Stars and Stripes, the Christian Science Monitor, among others. His latest article is in The American St Scholar. Um, it's called Afghanistan, a gathering menace. Traveling with U.S. troops gives insights into the recent mass massacre. We will link to it at our website, democracynow.org. Neil speaking to us from Raleigh, North Carolina. This is Democracy Now! Back in a minute.